Okay. Um, this week, uh, we are pleased to have uh, one of our faculty members, Oldo Javidas. It's our pleasure. Um, I don't know how to uh, present or introduce Oldo Javidas because we have so much history. But um, to keep things formal, let me briefly uh, read his uh, short biography. Um, Oldo Javidas is a professor in our department, working primarily in the field of uh, computer graphics. He holds a PhD degree in computer science from the University of Central Florida. And his research interests include high dynamic range imaging, color visual perception, uh, image processing, and computer graphics. And actually, he's um, a very uh, globally known figure in um, HDR, high dynamic range imaging. So it's our uh, pleasure to listen to his recent work. Uh, the screen is yours. Well, yes, we can start. Thank you very much, Sinan uh, Thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, and thanks uh, to Image Lab for inviting me for this talk. Uh, today, I would like to present uh, our work on uh, deep joint deinterlacing and denoising for uh, single shot, duly so, HDR reconstruction. So the title has many terms. Uh, I will explain them uh, during the paper. Uh, this uh, during the presentation. So this work uh, is, uh, we uh, did it together with uh, my student, Ur Choalan. So actually he is the first author of this work. And he did this as a part of his master's degree uh, at Matthew. And after uh, this work, uh, um, perhaps as a result of the success of this work, he was accepted to Max Planck Institute PhD program in Saarbrücken. So he's currently now uh, continuing his uh, PhD work on uh, related uh, further topics uh, of this study. So I would like to thank Ur also for his hard work on this. So um, um, briefly, my outline, I will quickly start with uh, defining dynamic range uh, because perhaps uh, HDR is, could be new for some participants here. Um, and we will, uh, I will briefly mention HDR capture problems. Uh, and uh, talk about dual ISO imaging, what is dual ISO, uh, how it can contribute to dynamic range. And we will talk about uh, noise modeling because noise, uh, elimination of noise or reduction of noise is one of the main things that we had to do to improve dynamic range. Uh, then uh, we will talk about our algorithm uh, and share some results uh, and conclude the presentation with some ideas for future work. So uh, also please interrupt me during the presentation. I would be very happy to uh, answer uh, any questions and uh, discussions. Don't wait till the end. Um, so dynamic range uh, is typically defined as the uh, ratio between the maximum and minimum luminance in a given scene. Uh, so if, uh, let me open my laser pointer. So if this is the maximum luminance region and if this is the minimum luminance region, uh, the dynamic range is divided by, is found, is found by dividing them. And typically we take the logarithm 10. So we report the dynamic range result as uh, let's say five, for example, five means uh, like uh, 100,000 to one. Uh, and uh, dynamic range uh, has also some other definitions, actually more correct definitions we can say, or more formal definitions. It is, uh, considered as the maximum to minimum luminance, but uh, the minimum is selected so that the noise level is less than a certain threshold. Uh, as an example, I put this uh, figure, uh, it's a dynamic range uh, measurement chart. So let's say this is the peak luminance uh, and uh, uh, imagine that this number, uh, number 16, uh, or uh, this goes from zero to 20. So number 20, uh, so you, we can say that the dynamic range is found by dividing the luminance of uh, zone zero to zone 20, but that is not necessarily the case because zone 20 may, due to being uh, very dark, it may have so much noise. So if you look at the patch here, compute the standard deviation around that of that patch, it could be higher than the threshold. So it is not considered to, uh, uh, it's not considered as the L-min in the computation of dynamic range. So we may need to come uh, in this direction to perhaps zone 15 or 14 uh, to reach that threshold. So therefore, uh, in defining dynamic range, noise is an important uh, 
attributes, we cannot just take the minimum. We need to select the minimum where the noise is below a certain threshold. Um, so why high dynamic range is important? Uh, because the world uh, itself is uh, very high, di high dynamic, it has a high dynamic range. So from uh, starlight uh, to sunlight, uh, the world itself uh, contains a dynamic range of more than 10 orders of magnitude. And uh, of course, as humans, we are not capable of adapting to this entire range. Uh, in a given situation, our dynamic range is uh, reported to be around five orders of magnitude. So indicated by this uh, spectrum here. But uh, we, uh, thanks to the means of visual adaptation, we can shift uh, the center of our adaptation. And as a result, we can be uh, more sensitive in this part or if, if it's a brighter environment, we become more sensitive here. If it's even brighter, our central adaptation shifts. Uh, as for the digital cameras, the digital uh, typical digital cameras that are currently used have a much smaller dynamic range compared to the human eye. So their dynamic range uh, is around, uh, is in between two to three orders of magnitude. So as a result, uh, a single photograph obtained by a, uh, by a digital camera uh, is called low dynamic range. It doesn't contain the details that the human eye can see uh, and uh, also present in the environment. So um, high dynamic range capture, uh, the problem of high dynamic range capture is becoming more and more important nowadays. Uh, there are several reasons for that. I mean, people have been trying to create high dynamic range images for maybe more than 25 years. Uh, but uh, the reason for it being more popular nowadays is because uh, uh, of the high dynamic range uh, TVs and high dynamic range streaming services that, uh, that we, we have started to see. Um, so uh, I'm sure uh, all of you or most of you has noticed the Amazon Prime HDR service or YouTube HDR service. So what are they? Uh, they are some video streaming services that stream HDR content. Uh, how is it streamed? So HDR content comes as a metadata uh, inside a regular uh, content. So it, it could be uh, something like uh, H.264 encoded data as the main image, but the data to make it HDR comes as part of the metadata of that stream. And there are some standards that define how that, that, that metadata should be represented. Uh, among these, HDR10 plus and Dolby Vision are currently the dominating standards. So for each frame, uh, there's a main image and also there is uh, extra information in the metadata of the frame to make it HDR. And the TVs that are aware of this uh, metadata processing uh, can read this and show the contents to you in, uh, in an HDR format. Uh, the only limitation of them is the peak luminance, uh, because due to high power consumption of the backlights, LED lights, uh, to reach very high luminances uh, that, are, uh, that exist in the real world, they need to use so much power, and therefore their peak luminances are, uh, are limited, um, but uh, they can have high dynamic range. However, despite this increase in, uh, in uh, high dynamic range content, uh, the need for high dynamic range content, capturing HDR images is, remains to be a big challenge. There are some specialized cameras, uh, but uh, they are very expensive and bulky and they have some other limitations and usually like only accessible by professional studios. Uh, so not uh, easy to obtain for most people. Uh, so uh, as an alternative to these specialized cameras, uh, people create HDR images, uh, have been creating HDR images for a long time uh, using the multiple exposures technique. So this technique, uh, this is actually an image that I have taken myself uh, uh, in Germany. Uh, so uh, low, medium and high, uh, I've captured three exposures, low, medium and high, and merged them into a single HDR frame or HDR image uh, using an equation like that. So basically you have uh, different exposures, each with a different exposure time. And uh, we divide each exposure by the exposure time uh, or uh, the gain, uh, whatever the difference between these exposures, you normalize and then you compute uh, 
a weighted summation. So F here represents the weight you give to each exposure pixel. So we compute a weighted summation and then normalized by the weight to obtain the HDR image. Uh, but of course we tone map it as the next step in order to make displayable as a standard JPEG image. Uh, so this is how HDR is created, but there's an extra step which involves tone mapping it. Uh, but if we had an HDR display, we, we could uh, skip that step theoretically. So this multiple exposure technique uh, has some important limitations. Uh, one of the main things is that uh, the scene and the camera must be static. If it is not, uh, then we can have uh, artifacts known as ghosting uh, in HDR literature. So here's a, a picture uh, which, is, uh, which I've taken with my handheld camera. So the object is static, but uh, the camera wasn't perfectly static. And therefore there were some shifts uh, in the, in between each exposure. And uh, unless you do some uh, software processing, uh, it creates artifacts like this known as ghosting artifacts. Uh, if, the, if there's motion in the scene, it's going to be even more severe. And if, if the motion of the scene uh, is combined with the motion of the camera, the problem gets even more, uh, more and more difficult. So actually, uh, I think you all know him very well. Uh, in a study that we made with Okan, Okan Tarhan Tursun, uh, we have reviewed uh, the state of the art in HDR degosting. Uh, so this is from 2015. And even then, uh, there were more than 50 method degosting methods that try to uh, that a, uh, aim to remove this kind of artifacts. Uh, and uh, there are even more methods uh, when it comes to video, uh, um, extra methods for video. Uh, again, this is uh, from a survey that we made in 2017. But I can easily say that as of today, uh, both of these numbers um, uh, has must have been easily doubled because uh, every day uh, really like new degosting methods appear. Now, despite a large number of methods that are present, uh, degosting is a very, very difficult problem. And even the best uh, quality methods uh, are not good enough. Uh, they have many limitations and they can uh, fail in, uh, they work in some cases, but they can fail in some other cases. So we can say that, uh, despite the large number of algorithms, there is no production quality. I mean, there is no like 100% dependable or commercial grade degosting method, we can say, because the motion in the environment can be very complex, uh, like a flag waving uh, or people uh, walking or interacting with each other, uh, cars going at high speed, low speed. So. Uh, each of these exhibits uh, they themselves as artifacts in the final image. And there could even be uh, some cases which are uh, like almost theoretically impossible to deal with because you could have a motion in the environment. Uh, and at the same time, your two exposures, uh, the motion region may be uh, overexposed or underexposed in both of the exposures. So uh, that's... Uh, really uh, makes it very difficult to uh, correct uh, these kind of artifacts. But I can say this is one of the main uh, research topics in HTML imaging, how to deal with degosting. Now, uh, coming back to our methods, uh, because of the difficulties of this uh, kind of HDR capture methods, uh, mainly the degosting problem, uh, we decided to use a single image-based HDR reconstruction approach. Uh, so it's, uh, what we do there is we capture uh, an image which contains both low and high exposures within itself. So it goes like this. So the first uh, scan lines are high uh, and then you have low exposure scan lines and then high exposure scan lines. So uh, technically like the resolution of the high scan lines is uh, uh, half the resolution of the original image, I mean the vertical resolution. And uh, it's the same for the low scan lines. So it is possible to capture such an image by using some uh, uh, custom firmware. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, you could also like, if, if your lab is, uh, if you have a lab that is really uh, uh, specialized in like sensor design or these low, uh, low level electron, electronic design things, you can design a sensor like that, that does this. 
or you can place a neutral density filter in front of your sensor. And the density filter may have different uh, trans transmissivity uh, for different scan lines. These are possible, but it's very difficult. You need a hardware lab for that. Um, as an alternative, there are some software solutions. Uh, there is a, a custom uh, firmware called Magic Lantern. Uh, it's uh, designed for uh, Canon cameras. So you basically uh, install the firmware on, onto your camera, onto your uh, Canon camera. You copy the uh, firmware into an SD card. Uh, but it will void your warranty. So uh, they don't give any uh, warranties. Um, uh, but as a result, they enable a lot of features that don't exist in the, or that, that exist, but are not uh, exposed by the original camera firmware. So one of these modes is the dual ISO mode, and uh, it allows to capture um, alternating scan lines at different ISO settings. And ISO controls the sensitivity of the sensor. So low ISO represents low exposure and high ISO represents high exposure. But ISO also changes the noise characteristics uh, of the image, uh, which I will mention. So as, an, as a result, we obtain uh, an image, a single image, which contains uh, ISO 100 and ISO 1600 scan lines uh, for an exposure ratio of 16. Um, but other combinations are also possible depending on what uh, you need to do. Now, uh, our algorithm also works in the buyer domain. Uh, let me briefly explain uh, this domain uh, for those who are not familiar with it. So the uh, image sensor does not actually contain um, three times uh, resolution. So there is not a sensor element for each uh, color channel. So each sensor element uh, actually uh, is either red uh, or green or blue. And uh, typically this pattern is known as the RGGB pattern. Uh, so the sensor itself is neutral. Uh, it doesn't know about color, but each sensor element is uh, overlaid with a color filter. Uh, it's microscopic scale, of course. Uh, and so therefore each uh, sensor element receives a different color. And then uh, we process this in the camera. The ISP of the camera processes this uh, image to produce the RGB image that we are used to. But uh, we have implemented our algorithm directly in the buyer domain. So we didn't uh, uh, use the ISP processing of the camera. Uh, the reason that we want to do, the, do this was because uh, it actually reduces the amount of information you need to process and learn. Uh, because once you get to three channels, you have RGB. But if you start with the directly, if you work on the color filter array, basically you have the full control and you have a single channel image, uh, but uh, of course each channel records a different color information. Now, uh, so this is what the input to our algorithm is. So it's a single image uh, with alternating scan lines and the alternation actually occurs in every two uh, scan lines. So it's not like one low, one high, it's actually two scan lines with high and then two with low and so on. The reason for that is it, makes it possible to do demosaicing or debiring possible. Because if we had RG high and GB on the low exposure, uh, it's going to mess up with the uh, demosaicing process. So to make the demosaicing easier, uh, these two groups, uh, so this is one unit that you can demosaic together. Uh, the alternation occurs at every two scan lines. So the Magic Lantern uh, does this for you. Okay, so um, does, are there any questions so far? Um, if so, please uh, interrupt me. Otherwise, I will continue with the noise uh, in digital images, uh, which is uh, re related to our work. So um, to model, uh, I mean, as we all know, uh, noise is an uh, unavoidable part of imaging. Uh, any measurement that you make with a sensor will come with a certain amount of noise. And there are multiple noise sources, uh, such as reset noise, photon shot noise, dark current noise, and uh, photo response non-uniformity, dark current non-uniformity noise, uh, flicker noise, white noise, thermal noise, quantization noise. So 
all of them uh, affect the uh, captured image uh, at different stages. Uh, so as a simplified noise model uh, or as a simplified image formation model, let's look at this equation. So uh, for uh, a sensor element J, uh, J indicates the sensor element, we have uh, irradiance that falls on the sensor and each pixel, each sensor element may have a uh, somewhat different gain due to photoresponse non-uniformity. Uh, I mean, each sensor element may have a little bit different size in a macroscopic scale. So it becomes the gain. And then there's some dark current that uh, is unavoidable, unavoidable due to heating of the element. And that itself is multiplied by the exposure time uh, to give us the total charge that uh, is recorded by the camera. Now, uh, this total charge here, uh, in our case, uh, let's uh, isolate the gain or explicitly mention the gain. So that is uh, the total charge is multiplied by the gain of the camera. For example, if it is ISO 100, it is multiplied by, let's say, uh, un a factor of one. Uh, if it is ISO 1600, it's multiplied by a factor of 16, for example. And then there is some read noise, which is a general name given to multiple noise sources, uh, such as quantization, white noise, flicker noise. And uh, then there is um, furthermore quantization uh, in, before we compute to the final uh, digital value, which is represented by V. Okay, so this is the uh, process uh, of, the, of how we go from the sensor irradiance XJ to uh, the recorded digital value, V. Uh, here, uh, J is the index of the sensor element, so kind of like the pixel index, and I is the index of the exposure. Now, the variance of this digital value actually will be equal to this. Uh, so the variance of the, uh, the value is equal to, uh, is computed by the square of the gain, uh, and it's also uh, times the variance of the uh, exposure itself, which, de which depends on the variances of these factors and so on. Uh, and then plus uh, we have the variance of the uh, read noise. Okay, uh, now uh, if you go one more step, if we have two exposures, uh, one with a high gain and the other is a low gain, and if we divide these exposures, if we divide the standard deviations uh, or the variances of these exposures, uh, it will basically look like this. So we just take this formula and repeat it for on the numerator and on the denominator. What is different between them in, terms of in, uh, in case of dual ISO is the gains are different. So the high exposure has a high gain in this term and the low exposure has a low gain. So that's one thing. And uh, actually, if you imagine how this is going to look like, so for low exposures, uh, when uh, the exposure uh, is very low, uh, this uh, part is going to uh, kind of diminish and uh, the ratios will approximate the uh, ratios of the read noise. But for high exposures, then this part will become less important uh, and uh, there will be saturation, the sensor saturation, and therefore the, uh, this ratio will uh, tend toward unity. Now for dual ISO, one of the things that, uh, why dual ISO matters is uh, actually uh, uh, hidden in this read noise. So the read noise uh, has, is uh, divided into two components. One is the pre-amplifier read noise, and the other is the post-amplifier read noise. So, uh, the uh, pre-amplifier read noise, so gain, uh, gain is a setting that controls the amplifier of the camera. Uh, and therefore, if you have a noise before the amplification stage, then uh, the high uh, ISO image will have uh, high uh, read noise because it is multiplied. Whatever the noise you have here is going to get multiplied. But the post-amplifier read noise is independent of the gain. Okay, so after the gain has already been applied. So therefore, uh, actually uh, taking an uh, image and multiplying its values by 16 
is not is is not the same thing as capturing uh, uh, an ISO 1600 image. Um, so the relationship is actually the ISO 1600 image is going to be less noisy compared to just multiplying an image. Because if you just take a, a pixels and multiply by a certain number after they have been recorded as pixels, it's too late. You are going to multiply the noise by the same amount, so you are not going to gain anything. But because of this separation between pre-amplifier and post-amplifier uh, noise, uh, high ISO images will actually have the potential to reduce the noise floor. And this is what we uh, capitalize on in this work. So just to give a summary, uh, one raw image uh, contains two types of scan lines, low and high. And high ISO scan lines are actually less noisy when normalized. So this is important, when normalized. And uh, therefore, it, may, it is possible to reduce the noise floor and thus increase the dynamic range. Please remember the uh, noise-based definition of dynamic range uh, by using a dual, dual system. And as a result, uh, the, uh, our problem becomes a joint deinterlacing and denoising problem. Now, uh, I will explain uh, how we uh, address this problem. But um, uh, firstly, let's uh, show the results of a naive approach, let's say. Uh, now, imagine that we start with this dual ISO input. And uh, as the first thing that comes into mind, uh, let's take the low exposures into its own image, uh, sorry, low scan lines into its own image, and high scan lines into its own image. So they will have half vertical resolution. And then let's upsample them using uh, some upsampling algorithm such as bicubic uh, upsampling, and then merge them to HDR. So in that in that case, you see results like that. Okay, so uh, this is not high quality. Uh, this is the ground truth, uh, by the way, and we can clearly see that it is uh, not high quality because uh, of the noise as well as. Uh, upsampling artifacts. We can see these like staircase artifacts that occur due to uh, upsampling uh, of the low and high exposures. Now, uh, to improve on this, uh, we uh, developed a, a system, uh, let's say an algorithm or a framework um, that looks like this on the uh, on this picture. So what we do here is uh, we actually uh, experimentally compute the noise that is present in a, uh, or uh, let me say that we compute the noise uh, difference between the low ISO and high ISO or ISO scan lines. Um, we, uh, I will show that. Uh, so we experimentally compute the noise. And then we obtain uh, perfect, uh, almost perfect ground truth images by frame averaging. So when it says, when I say like perfect or ground truth, uh, I mean, you can never have uh, zero noise, but it is significantly re reduced noise, we can say. So by in, uh, frame averaging, you capture multiple images, uh, let's say 20 images of the same environment without any change. And then you average them. Uh, if everything was static, uh, due to this averaging, uh, the standard deviation of the noise uh, gets reduced. Uh, significantly. So that can serve as a ground truth. And then, uh, so we have the low uh, exposure ground truth, high exposure ground truth, and then we simulate interlacing that is done in the camera. So what we do is we uh, take from each ground truth, we take the low uh, exposure and high exposure and interlace them to produce an image that looks like what the camera was going to give us or is going to give us. And then we add noise on this data uh, using the noise simulation. And this noise simulation is based on our experimental evaluation of noise. So at this point, the image that we obtain uh, is very similar to what we are going to get from the camera. Uh, but the difference is we also have the ground truth, which can be used in a supervised uh, learning training framework. Uh, if we directly get these images uh, without the ground truth, we couldn't really improve improve them. But because we simulated and uh, created our own DLC images, uh, which is similar to what the camera is going to give us, we can use this for training. So 
uh, we train two networks. Uh, one is tuned for low exposures and the other is for high exposures. I will explain the uh, network architectures uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, and this network basically learns to map these, uh, de in uh, these interlaced noisy patches to ground truth patches. And uh, that uh, is basically uh, the training phase. And in the testing phase, uh, we give a real dual ISO uh, image from the camera. Uh, and uh, because the networks are trained, uh, they can produce high quality, low and high exposures. Then uh, we do color processing like demo mosaicing and so on to go to RGB. And then we merge uh, the RGB frames to obtain the HDR image. So that's our pipeline. Now, uh, let me talk about some details. So the, one of the critical parts is the noise simulation. So what we did is we uh, computed the noise uh, uh, difference between the, or the noise ratio between the high ISO scan lines and the low ISO scan lines. Uh, so this uh, orange curve is, uh, is the smoothed version of that. So as you can see, the uh, ratio changes. It's, uh, it depends on the pixel value. It is not constant, like it's not always 16. Uh, it depends, it is a special, uh, not special, but it's, it's as a uh, intensity based relationship. So uh, it's, uh, it's not uniform. So we computed this curve for our camera. And uh, I would like to say that this curve can be different for each camera. Uh, so uh, this part may be repeated uh, if our work needs to be used by uh, in other cameras. This part may need to be repeated, but uh, as I will share um, uh, towards the end, we actually tested our method on images captured with a different camera and uh, it also works. So uh, why, how did we use this information? How did we use this orange curve? So we first of all uh, are trying to simulate noise. So in order to simulate noise, we selected some uh, standard deviation in the range uh, from 0 to two, uh, 0 0.03. And uh, this is assuming that the pixel values are between 0 and 1. Uh, so uh, it's about 2% of the maximum uh, value. So we compute the high exposure using uh, a noise uh, which is drawn from uh, this standard deviation. So we first select the standard deviation randomly within this range, and then we corrupt the ground truth high exposure by adding the noise uh, based on the drawn standard deviation. And then using this information, we compute the noise that is suitable, uh, that, that should be added to the low exposure. So this PL or, or sigma, P, uh, sigma uh, PL comes from the comes from this curve basically. So that uh, we produce a realistic noise um, amount uh, based on the experimental measurements. Okay, and as for the network architecture, um, we use two identical architectures for low and high exposures. Uh, we uh, decided to use a residual network architecture and uh, one convolutional layer, uh, I, I have a picture in the next slide, but one convolutional layer fo was followed by C residual layers and C was 10 in our case. And each residual layer had two layers in it. Uh, and after the residual layers, there were two more convolutional layers, uh, which uh, led to a total of 23 convolutional layers. And in each convolutional layer, uh, we used three by three kernels, small kernels. Uh, but uh, co we combined these small kernels with uh, dilated convolutions, uh, which we found to improve the performance significantly. So I will briefly mention that uh, in the next slides. And uh, we removed batch normalization uh, based on uh, some uh, work uh, in the literature. Uh, and uh, we uh, also edit uh, skip connections, symmetric skip connections uh, across the residual blocks. So there are uh, skip connections inside the residual blocks already, but we added symmetric skip connections. So these ideas come from reviewing the uh, 
related work and uh, trying to follow the practice that uh, they found to be uh, useful and also based on our experimental results. So uh, the architecture uh, graphically looks like this. So there's one convolutional layer, then there are 10 residual blocks and each residual block uh, has two convolutional layers separated by a ReLU. And uh, there are skip connections inside the residual blocks. And also there are symmetric skip connections between the residual blocks. And as for the dilated convolutions, um, uh, so it's a technique to, uh, is used to improve the receptive field of the kernel. Um, and uh, so you don't change the kernel size, but you uh, dilate your kernel and apply it uh, to improve the receptive field. So during the training, our patch sizes, patch size that we feed to the network was uh, 136 by 136. Uh, and uh, by using uh, dilated convolutions with these dilation factors, we were able to uh, set the total uh, receptive field of the network to be equal to the patch size. Because if you don't, uh, then uh, the boundary pixels or the pixels around the center don't really contribute. Uh, you can reduce your patch size in that case, but we have found uh, an increased patch size to improve the performance uh, based on our experiments. So uh, as for the training, uh, there were no existing dual ISO training sets. So we had to create our own data set and we made it publicly available uh, for people's use. Uh, so uh, this training data set contains raw images captured with our Canon camera uh, at uh, 5,000 by uh, 3,400 resolution. So these contain ground truths basically. And in order to uh, make them ground truths, uh, each image uh, was captured 20 or more times at each setting. So to obtain a low ISO ground truth, we set the camera to low ISO mode and captured 20 or more images uh, and averaged them to obtain the ground truth and similarly for the high exposure. So as a result, we were all able to obtain uh, 110 pairs. So 220 in total, uh, pay, uh, low and high exposure ground truths. For the training, uh, as I mentioned before, we divided the patches to, uh, we divided the images to 136 by 136 patches. And uh, we applied data augmentation by uh, rotating and shearing these patches. So as a result of this, uh, the total patch number of patches we could train our networks with was uh, around uh, 500,000. So for each network, uh, we trained with this number of patches. Uh, we used L2 loss uh, during the training. So uh, which is basically the predicted uh, result by our network minus the ground truth result. And this is for normalization. Uh, we um, used the EDIM optimizer, uh, which I believe is, is most typically used. Uh, batch size was set to 64 and um, uh, we used the uh, TensorFlow backend uh, with Keras. Uh, thanks to Truba, uh, we were able to uh, run our uh, simulations uh, on or training uh, on high quality GPUs and NVIDIA Tesla P100 GPU was used. And uh, the training took about 90 hours for both networks. But of course, uh, for due to um, having to come perform many experiments, I mean, this was like 90 hours times a large number uh, because we had to compare many, many alternatives. But in the end, the final network is trainable in uh, about uh, in more than three days and less than four days. So uh, of course, uh, there are many alternatives. Uh, so why did we choose these? It was mostly based on experiments. Uh, we tried like patch sizes of 32 and 64 or network depths uh, 6, 11, 16 without residual blocks or skip con co uh, connections. Uh, initially, we did not uh, use dilated convolutions, uh, uh, but uh, through, uh, in a sense, trial and error uh, and uh, also uh, trying to follow the best practices in the deep learning literature, 
uh, we uh, found the final settings. Uh, also, we tried different types of uh, architectures. So, uh, for example, we tried a pure residual network, uh, a residual network with dilated convolutions, uh, and a residual network with dilated convolutions and sy symmetric skip connections. So this was our final architecture. But we also tried joint architectures. Uh, so uh, instead of having like two separate networks, uh, we tried architectures that are initially joined, then they fork into different paths, and then they join again at the end. So we experimented with these, but we found the this design uh, to be the best performing, and I will have a comparison uh, in a couple of slides. So now let's talk about the results. Um, we are uh, almost finished. Uh, so let's first start with the most uh, straightforward result, uh, comparing with uh, our approach with the alternatives. So this uh, is uh, on A, uh, in the picture uh, in A, we see the naive bicubic uh, interpolated result uh, from a single dualist image. So we can see that this is both noisy and it also has the uh, interlacing artifacts, staircase artifacts. Now, alternatively, let's say, we took two full resolution exposures. So ISO 100 and ISO 1600, okay? Not dual ISO. Uh, so this is not applicable really because if there is motion in the environment, it's going to create problems. But let's say we had that. When we combine them into an HD image, we are going to see noise. So there are no deinterlacing artifacts because they are full resolution, but there is noise. On the other hand, if we take uh, just if we uh, apply uh, our, uh, if we use interlaced but noise free images. So uh, you start with uh, noise free images but interlaced. Uh, then, uh, by as a result of bicubic in uh, upsampling, you will obtain uh, interlaced, you will see interlacing artifacts. So, actually, both of these, like B and C, are shown. Uh, to show that like simple approaches do not really work. Uh, although they are not really applicable in, uh, I mean, how uh, you cannot really obtain a noise-free image. Uh, this we created from our ground truths. Or uh, if you start with full resolution, uh, it defeats the purpose because uh, there could be motion. Uh, so you, you want to capture everything in one, one shot. So this is our result in comparison, and this is the ground truth. So uh, as we can see, it resembles the ground truth uh, um, more than any other approaches. So I would like to show uh, another example. Uh, so this is how uh, an interlaced dual ISO image looks like. Uh, but uh, for visualization purposes, uh, I have created these figures. We have created these figures by uh, demo mosaicing them. Uh, so we are seeing the demo mosaic result. Uh, so we see color result, but actually uh, the algorithm works in the Bayer domain. So you can see the dual ISO images look like this. Uh, there are like low and high scan lines. And from such an image, our algorithm produces two images, low exposure and high exposure. And then when you merge them into an HD image, you have the details in both the dark regions and also in light regions. So this is the workflow or, or a summary of what, what is done in the algorithm. Now, um, we compared our results with uh, many works in the literature that are known to be state of the art. So here is a, a brief summary uh, of uh, from six different uh, or three, uh, seven different, uh, for seven different samples. So this column represents our results and uh, the rightmost column is the ground truth. So we can see that uh, all uh, our results in general are, are better. Like uh, for example, uh, in this work, uh, the details are blurred significantly. Some artifacts are introduced. In some other works, uh, noise is visible. There is a lot of noise. Uh, so uh, in our results, uh, the, it's more closer to the ground truth. Uh, to uh, compute uh, the 
overall results, we uh, actually uh, obtained 466 images uh, or small images, let's say 400 by 400 small images from a test set. Uh, so we actually captured images in high resolution, but we cropped uh, non-overlocking uh, regions, uh, 400 by 400, and we computed the PSNR. Uh, of uh, our results uh, and the uh, results in the literature. So our PSNR, uh, this is the best result that we had uh, our proposed architecture. Uh, we could easily, uh, I mean, we could reach PSNR values uh, around 43, which is a high number. Uh, and all of the works that we compared with in the literature were actually falling short. Uh, they had uh, PSNRs less than uh, 40. And, Bicubic is the is the is the worst one, which is expected. Uh, we also compared our uh, results with the inverse tone mapping algorithms because inverse tone mapping algorithms also take a single image as input and they try to um, compute an HDR image from this. And uh, our Im uh, input is also a single image. Therefore, we thought uh, it's uh, it should be compared against them. So there are two, uh, at the time of our study, there were two uh, well-known inverse tone mapping works uh, by Eilertsen and Endo. So uh, as you can see, so the first row uh, indicates uh, one of one region and the second row is a different region. Uh, so we can see that um, the inverse tone mapping algorithms, uh, even if you start them from different ISO settings, so to be fair, uh, we fed them with a middle ISO image, low ISO image and high ISO image. Uh, so even if you start them uh, with different from ISO, different ISO values, their reproduction quality was not as good as ours. Uh, so we can see that all of them have more noise and uh, some of them actually uh, have a very poor performance in terms of uh, reconstructing details. Also, there was uh, a well-known work, uh, which is a deep joint demosaicing and denoising. Uh, we uh, compared our results with that work. So that work uh, also works on the Bayer domain. Uh, so what they do is they do demosaicing. I mean, we don't do demosaicing, by the way. So that works does demosaicing and denoising, but it's a very well-known denoising algorithm. So the best uh, that algorithm could do uh, in uh, was for this input uh, at least was something like this and our results uh, can it can be clearly seen that it has less noise and some details are actually visible uh, in the background here uh, which are not visible here are closer to the ground truth so uh, this uh, single shot uh, method allows uh, allows us to capture high dynamic range images of uh, highly dynamic scenes Actually, this, uh, this fish is from my own aquarium. Um, so I could easily capture this uh, with, with them. Uh, I mean, with multiple exposures, this would be almost impossible. Um, this uh, boiling uh, pot, uh, I mean, flames, uh, you can see uh, have a complex motion. And you can see in the background, there are actually dark regions in the shade. Uh, and in, on the uh, pot, uh, the cover, the lid of the pot is shiny. So, but in this image, we can clearly see that this is not overexposed, but at the same time, the details here are visible. And also uh, images like, uh, like water and complex things can be captured. Uh, also, uh, the, this makes the algorithm, a uh, single shot approach makes the algorithm applicable to videos. Um, so um, if each frame of your video is a dual, dual ISO frame, you can apply this independently. So you can obtain uh, HDR frames. And then by uh, applying a temporal tone mapping operator, you can obtain um, smoothly varying video without any ghosting artifacts. Uh, these flames are uh, uh, notoriously difficult to capture, uh, to, to correct by degosting algorithms. But in our case, there is no problem. And uh, we have shown that uh, despite uh, having developed our networks or trained our networks for ISO 100, ISO 1600 combination, uh, actually uh, 
you can, if as input, if you feed in other uh, ISO combinations, such as ISO 100, ISO 800, or ISO 100, ISO 3200, it still works. Uh, because uh, the networks learn to scale what is present in the input, basically. They don't really learn to make everything uh, has a ratio of 16. So um, therefore, if in your input, if the, if the input if, uh, if the ratio is eight, then it is preserved in the output. And the same for this case. So we wanted to show this uh, because some people, for some environments, maybe this is not the desirable uh, setting. Uh, you may want to use a different pair for increasing the uh, dynamic range. And uh, also, uh, we want to show that if you capture images with some other camera uh, than the one that we used in, the, in our training, you still get very good results. Uh, so this, these results are, uh, this image are from, is from uh, other authors, uh, I believe either from Haji Sherif or Rodriguez. So we took their dual ISO image and applied our algorithm on it. And we were able to get better results. Here we can see like two regions highlighted. Uh, uh, our results uh, were better. Uh, of course, there is no ground truth for this case because the, this image uh, did, it came from a different source. Uh, finally, as for the runtime performance, uh, it, it is also better uh, from the compared methods. So. Uh, even if you use a CPU version or GPU version, I mean, GPU version is obviously faster, uh, but uh, we could, for example, process a one, uh, one megapixel image uh, in two seconds. Uh, so we had to perform this test on small images because some of the methods could not actually finish uh, in large images or large exposures. So uh, our algorithm linearly scales. So if we had a five megapixel image, it would take around 10, uh, 10, 11 seconds. Now, uh, I would like to conclude uh, with, uh, with a summary and um, some ideas for future work. Uh, so in this work, we uh, proposed a deep learning based dual ISO uh, reconstruction, and we were able to obtain HDR reconstructions with a PSNR value higher than 40 decibels. Uh, and uh, as a result, we uh, believe we address the state of the art, uh, both in terms of efficiency and quality. Uh, we attribute uh, this improvement to, uh, to an accurate noise modeling and simulation, and also by using a suitable network architecture. So uh, we uh, actually hope that this kind of cameras where you can have dual ISO or dual exposure combinations uh, within a single uh, image uh, will become more widely available. So you don't really need to use custom firmware uh, so that uh, creating HDR content uh, will become easier. Uh, I mean, there are uh, of course certain uh, future work directions. Uh, I guess I forgot to put it uh, on, on the slide, but uh, I can mention a few. Um, firstly, uh, Improvements can be made uh, by using a perhaps more novel uh, different network architectures, like uh, perhaps GANs can be used because we are generating patches and uh, we have the ground truth data. Uh, so we may be able to perhaps get better results by using these. It should be tested uh, or things like uh, dense, uh, even more denser networks. Uh, secondly, uh, for video, in the end, because images are great, but uh, for, uh, I mean, content usually means video, uh, especially for uh, professional uh, people, right? So uh, our algorithm uh, can be more thoroughly tested in case of videos, and uh, even further noise reductions can be achieved by using temporal, uh, like a spatio-temporal application of this work because the frames are coherent with each other and you can benefit from the previous or next frame to obtain uh, even less noisy results. So these are two uh, future directions that uh, I think uh, we can work on. So uh, that's all. Uh,
thank you very much for attention. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put a thank you slide, but I thank you all. Um, so uh, please, if you have any questions, I would be very happy. Uh, thank you, Zajan. That was a really nice uh, presentation. It was really informative for us uh, because uh, we are not used to working in the HDR domain, and that part was very informative for us. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, I had some questions, but we answered them uh, answered them uh, at the end. Um, so you use, I guess, Magic Lantern mm -hmm. on your camera to get the uh, uh, interlaced images, right? Yes, that's true. Okay. So uh, Magic Lantern is a really interesting firmware. Um, mm -hmm. If if anybody here has a Canon camera, I highly recommend. Uh, I mean, it says it will void, void your warranty, but uh, it never uh, created a problem uh, for our cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, it enables, I mean, besides this dual ISO capture, it enables many other things that people may find useful. For example, it enables capturing of an image with the clap of your hands. So you make this and it will capture an image. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be very uh, useful because uh, you don't want to touch your camera uh, even to uh, avoid like small movements. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I've actually used that uh, for uh, some other work. Uh, it adds uh, like a lot of overlays onto the uh, image LCD screen. So you can take better pictures. Uh, so that's a great uh, open source uh, initiative. Okay. There, there is a question in the chat um, from Kadir. Uh, he is asking whether you try different loss functions other than L1 loss, L2 loss, sorry. Um, I think we might have, but I really uh, don't know uh, the answer to this. Uh, we might have. Um, okay, uh, we can, we can uh, Kadir can check the paper. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a best, um, so you, you consider two ISO uh, pairs. Mm -hmm. um, is there an optimal way for choosing them? So how, how did you choose that? I, mean, I might have missed that part. Mm -hmm. So in general, uh, so um, ISO 100 and ISO 1600 is a ratio of 16, right? Uh, so it's a kind of like uh, ISO 100, if you consider ISO 100, so take a reference point mm -hmm. uh, and uh, ISO 100 is uh, like, uh, it, you can think of it as uh, one quarter of the exposure time mm -hmm. uh, of the reference point and uh, ISO 1600 as four times the exposure time. So uh, you're taking a center point uh, I mean, ISO is not changing exposure time, it's changing the gain, but uh, it's kind of resembles that. So uh, you basically, uh, with this combination, your inputs uh, become like minus two EV and plus two EV. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, is uh, in general, a uh, commonly used uh, difference when you merge exposures. Okay. I mean, if we also had a middle exposure at zero EV, that would be even better. But in this case, we don't. Uh, so if you increase more, like ISO 100, ISO uh, uh, 3200, 3200, then it becomes more separated. And as you start to separate the exposures, then their joint uh, regions become less and less. And mm -hmm. uh, you could actually start to lose information uh, in the middle. But if you also reduce them, uh, then uh, the dynamic range becomes compromised. So uh, there is no uh, like one setting works for all, but uh, as a convention, let's say, as a standard, uh, mm -hmm. ratio of minus two to plus two generally uh, works. Okay. Emre Hoca is, uh, thank uh, you. Emre Hoca, yes, thank you very much. Um, maybe we can stop recording and continue informally. Okay. Thank you, Oz Hocam, again. Uh, thank you very much. You will Continue.